right. Hey, good morning, Crossroads. What a beautiful day. God has been good. We've been doing some worship at all of our campuses. Good morning, Thornton Campus and Fort Lupton Campus and online campus. We are really thankful to be together today. Are we not? Yeah, we're thankful. God is good, and this is a great day. If you have a Bible, either on your phone, on your device, or you have a, a paper Bible, turn to Luke chapter 1. We are in a 13-episode um, season in the Gospel of Luke, and this will take us a couple years to get through the Gospel of Luke as we take this in seasons with different episodes intermixed over the next uh, couple years, and that gives us the privilege of going through this great text at a pace that helps us understand at a deeper level than if we didn't give it as much time. So we're very thankful to be able to go through Luke chapter 1 today. We're uh, ending the uh, first chapter of the Gospel of Luke today, and uh, we're thankful for what God is teaching us. Today we're looking at the, the account of the birth of one of the characters that Luke starts with, John the Baptist, in verse 57 is where we'll start. But I want to ask you a question before we get into this, because I want this to kind of ride along with us this morning. Has God ever done anything, let me say it this way, has God ever interrupted your life with an event or a change of plans that was so significant and perhaps unexpected, it turned your life your world upside down. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe it was somebody you met at one point and you ended up, uh, they changed your life. You ended up marrying that person perhaps or adopting that person or you went to work for that person. Or maybe that person hurt you or said something long ago that even today you cannot forget. Maybe God interrupted your life with an abundance of money, of finance, a financial resource, a big raise or an inheritance or just the ability to make money and live a really nice life. Or maybe God interrupted your life in a way that involved a move or a change of job or, or maybe it was a death. Maybe it was an unexpected pregnancy or a health issue. Has God ever interrupted your life with an event or a change of plans that was so significant and so unexpected that it turned your world upside down. I've had many of those interruptions in my life. I'm sure you have too, if you just think about it. Some good, some not so good. Most recently, my family and I had a really good interruption to our life, a really, really good one. My wife and I became grandparents again, not only of one, but of two beautiful girls that came into our lives through uh, uh, foster care. To, through foster care, my daughter and her husband uh, chose to be a foster family for a number of, um, for, uh, hold on to those, okay, Cole, hold on to those photos. I want them, I want them to kind of surprise everybody, <laughs> <laughs> which is not going to happen now, but that's okay. So our daughter and her husband, Lindsay and Andrew, became a foster home. Let's hear it for foster parents. That's a good thing, yes. Uh, and, they, and their first placement were these two beautiful uh, sibling girls, and uh, they came into their lives. And then through the process that uh, legal action takes and so forth, uh, they became uh, Lindsay and Andrew's legal daughters and our granddaughters a week ago Wednesday on September 25th in Adams County Court. Their names are Analea, thank you, Analea Rose and Ariella Grace. And here, here's why I want to hold off on the photos just for a second. Because I want to tell you that over the years I've been pastoring and ministering at this church, I have looked at hundreds, hundreds of photos of your babies and children and grandchildren. <laughs> it's payback time. <laughs> so here, here's a few photos of it. Now, here's what I do. Here's what I want you to do. When you, when you see them, I just want you to go, oh, that's what I do when I see yours. Even though sometimes I think it looks like every other kid I see. But I want you to just go, oh, isn't that beautiful? So here's Lindsay and Andrew and their girls. Right after court, they had these shirts made. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and here's another one. Just click through them, Cole. That's okay. Woo! Analea's the oldest one. <laughs> yeah, it's getting real. It's getting real. And then uh, check out this last one. Oh! Our granddaughters. Wow. A great, a great event that absolutely turned our world upside down. Well, here we are in Luke chapter 1, and we have another birth. We have the birth of John. Jesus, of course, is the main character. Uh, Joseph and Mary's uh, baby, Jesus. Mary, 
uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit and then Joseph eventually marrying Jesus. Uh, but, and, and can you even imagine that happening? But there's another couple uh, we've already met in the text. In fact, Luke starts his gospel with this introduction of a man named John the Baptizer, John the Baptist, who is Zechariah and Elizabeth's uh, child. They are old. Of course, Elizabeth and Mary, as you remember, are relatives. Mary and her soon-to-be husband, Joseph, are young. They're in their teens. But Elizabeth and Zechariah, they're old. Uh, Mary and Elizabeth, they know each other through, this, um, through their relationship. Maybe they're cousins. Elizabeth and Zechariah are in their 60s. The text says Elizabeth was barren. Oof. Those are hard words. She couldn't have kids. Here they are, husband and wife, in retirement age, no kids, no grandkids. They wanted kids. It's not like they decided at some point, like some people do, they just don't want to have kids. That's a decision people make. But these, this couple was infertile. They didn't have kids by, so, for whatever reason, and it was hard on them. And some of you know exactly what that's like. Then one day, this rare occasion happens where Zechariah, a priest in Jerusalem, the lot fell on him to go into the temple and offer an incense offering. And while in there, God interrupts his life in two significant ways. His dull, mundane life gets interrupted by God in two ways. It gets turned upside down. First, an angel appears to Zechariah and says, your wife Elizabeth will, will get pregnant. Between you and Elizabeth, Elizabeth was not an immaculate conception. Zechariah was involved. And they're in their 60s. You can paint the picture. And the angel says, your wife's going to have a baby. That's the first thing. The second thing is because of Zechariah's reaction to the angel... How can this be? I'm old. My wife's old. This is, you know, he kind of scoffs at the notion. Because of that scoffing at the angelic announcement, God makes him both deaf and mute. He can't speak or hear. All of a sudden, he's deaf and mute right there in the temple. He goes out of the temple after he performs his duties, and he can't speak. He can't hear. I want us to see something today that we can learn about how to react, ultimately how they reacted, how we can react when Unexpected interruptions happen in our life, good ones and bad ones, because I think the reaction is the same. A reaction to life-interrupting issues and situations should be the same, especially for Christians. It's been my experience many times over as a pastor of this church, uh, seeing people, ministering to them, watching them in unexpected events in their life that turn their life upside down, turn it inside out. Sometimes if it's a bad thing, people get stuck on this question, why? Why? Why did this happen? Why me? Why now? Why are you doing this, God? Sometimes good and bad, they say, why? Why did I deserve this? Sometimes that question is asked. And why is, isn't a bad question. We should ask. We can ask why. Jesus asked why. But I'll tell you what. It's a horrible place to live. Why is not a good place to live? Instead, I want to take a look at what Zechariah and Elizabeth ultimately did in their response to these life interruptions. Both Zechariah's mute and deafness and them being told they're going to, God's going to bless them with their lifelong desire to have a child. They probably asked why many times. Uh, Zachariah, I'm sure, in his quiet, new, his suddenly quiet world, is asking God why in his heart. But here's the text Luke takes specific measures to include this in his gospel. In fact, he starts the gospel not with the main character, Jesus, but with John and his birth. Why does he do that? And it's in part not only to show that John will be the forerunner of Jesus and introduce him to the world, but so that we could see a reaction to life circumstances that come our way, that turn our lives upside down, and what it means to have the kind of certainty that Elizabeth and Zechariah seem to have had about God in our lives as well as theirs by looking at that example. And by the time we get deep into the first chapter, one of the things he's showing us here that can be is that we can be certain, which is what he's writing this about uh, for, in, as you know. Luke is writing this gospel so that we would be certain about the things of Jesus, up back up in verse 4. And the certainty we see here is the certainty that Elizabeth and Zechariah are leaning into now as their lives take a dramatic turn. And it is the certainty of God's faithfulness, that God is faithful, a constant theme in our faith, in our singing, in our, in, in our ministry, in, in what it means to be a Christian, that God is faithful to fulfill his promises and do what he says and care for and love and sustain his people. And I know 
Somebody here needs to hear this loud and clear today. God is faithful. You can trust him in whatever you're going through. Whatever life interruptions are happening to you or have happened to you, good or bad, God is faithful. He hears your prayers. He answers your prayers. He loves you. He is working all things together for good, even if you don't see it right now, even if you can't believe it. Hear it. God is faithful. So here Luke is recording in this text the evidence of certainty about Jesus. Here the certainty of God's faithfulness that extends not only to famous people in the Bible, but to anyone who calls on his name, who calls out the name of Jesus. God is faithful. So let's read the text. This is Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 57. Luke writes the birth of John this way. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all the neighbors and all the things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was on him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us, the strength of salvation in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who who hate us, to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. That's about Jesus. Now Zechariah talks about his son. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to uh, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child, John, grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Now, certainly you notice what a big deal this naming of this child was, Zachariah and Elizabeth's baby. They, they were told to name him John. Zachariah would, of course, be the namesake for this child. That He would be named after his father, like most all Jewish boys. On the eighth day of circumcision, it was uh, the name reveal. You know, we have gender reveal parties today. Well, back then, the gender reveal was the delivery. Oh, it's a boy. And if it's a boy, there was great celebration. Out comes the pinatas and hula hoops and dancing and wine. Everybody's happy. If it happened to be a girl, well, everybody tucked their instruments under their arms and no more hula hoops and they went home. They were disappointed because it was cultural. And if that bothers you, get over it. So <laughs> this boy was born and, of course, everybody celebrated and, and knew his name would be Zechariah. Junior, ZJ, this would be little ZJ, but no. Elizabeth says, no, his name is to be John. Everybody's going, what? His name isn't John, his name is Zechariah. And they look at Zechariah, who cannot speak, who cannot hear, and they start making signs to him. I can't even imagine what that looks like. He, He doesn't even know sign language. What are they doing? So he asks for a tablet, and he writes four words on the wax. His name is John. And they all look at each other and start protesting to Elizabeth. None of your relatives is is called by this name. His name is John. His name is John. Names are a big deal. You have a name. 
Maybe you've even named other human beings. My wife and I have six kids. Four of them are adopted. All but one of them we got to name. Names are a big deal. Take it from a guy named Kim. <laughs> you know, it's kind of fun. None of us knew the middle names of our new granddaughters. Uh, have I told you about my granddaughters? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we knew their names were Analea and Ariella Brewer as of last Wednesday, the 25th. But we didn't know their middle names. And Lindsay and Andrew, they wouldn't tell us. They just went, they wanted it to be a surprise. And it came. The name reveal came in the courtroom in the most appropriate way. The judge read the document. Analea Rose Brewer. Ariella Grace. Family names Brewer. Connected to our family. We got the name reveal. It was, names are a big deal. Names are important. These names in the text are important. Your name is important. These names are in the narrative for a reason. Here's what they mean. Zechariah, whom God remembered. Elizabeth, God is my oath. John, God has been gracious. Now as you're writing those down, if you care to, names mean something. Back then in the first century, names weren't chosen for how they sound like we do today. Often we choose names by, by how they flow, how they sound, first, middle, last name. Back then, people named their kids for what they hoped their children would live into, what they hoped, it was like a prediction, like a prophecy, what they hoped their kids would become or what they do or what kind of person, what kind of character they would have. And Jewish kids, the boys, usually got their father's name, almost always the firstborn son did, or a name that identified a desired future, especially as it related to their faith in God. We, say, we see that in these three names, whom God remembered, God is my oath, God has been gracious. And as soon as Zechariah finishes writing those words, his name is John, all of a sudden he can speak and he can hear again, just like that. It's been nine months of silence. He must have wondered if he'd ever be able to hear or speak again, and then suddenly he gets his voice back. And what does Zechariah do the moment he gets his voice back? Right in the middle of all this life interruption, what's the first thing Luke records he does? He blesses God. He writes this beautiful song, this beautiful prayer. We call it the Benedictus. Remember Mary's song is called the Magnificat. This is the Benedictus, a good word. And he writes first about who John will be introducing to the world Jesus. He writes first about Jesus, the first part, verses 68 through 75. And then the last part, he, he writes about his son, what his son will be. You will be the one who will be the forerunner to the Messiah, the promised one of Israel. Because we know 30 years later, John will be standing on the shore of the Jordan River just before it dumps into the Dead Sea, way south, John the baptizer, the one God is using to bring people to repentance of their sins through baptism, a sign of repentance and forgiveness, a very common Jewish custom. And John will announce as Jesus steps out of the crowd, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John points everyone to Jesus. That's his mission. That's his goal. That's his desire. It probably should be ours as well. John will say, it's not about me, it's about him. You're following me, now follow Jesus, it's about him. And then these famous words spill out of John's mouth. He must increase, I must decrease. Remember how John says that? By the way, that's a good life motto for Christians. He must increase, I must decrease. I try to make that my motto. Jesus must increase, I must decrease. I'm learning how to make that my motto in this transition of senior leadership at Crossroads Church because by January 1st, a mere 12 weeks away, we'll be handing the baton of leadership over to Pastor Matt, and, I, and, then, and then he will be the, the senior leader of this church. And I keep saying to myself through this whole process, well, he must increase, and I must decrease. It's been my, my walking motto. John gives us a good model of something I'd like you to take away today, and this is this notion, this idea, this biblical truth of self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. It's a good value to have. It's, it essentially means thinking of yourself less. Self-forgetfulness. Not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. There's a difference. It's not really about us anyway. 
We live in a culture that makes everything about us, and Jesus comes along, and we give our lives to him, and all of a sudden, he must increase, I must decrease. I mean, think about what that is. And this is my whole point this morning. It's a statement that John makes of surrender, that Elizabeth and Zechariah demonstrate a, a statement of surrender, of acknowledgement of what God is doing and who he is. When we get the order right, he must increase, I must decrease, our lives get ordered right. That's Zechariah and Elizabeth's response in a word, it's surrender. He and his wife, in a response to this divine, life-changing interruption, surrender to God and his faithfulness. And as far as I can see and tell throughout the scriptures, and particularly here in Zechariah and Elizabeth's story, this narrative, there are at least three components that will serve us well today to remember, to see in the text, to bring them out. Three components, three legs, three pillars upon which surrender gravitates or stands. Surrender. Let's take a real quick look. There's something here for us today. Three things about the reaction and response to God when life interruptions take place and turn us inside out. The response Elizabeth and Zechariah demonstrate is surrender. Certainty. Christianity is about surrender. Certainly we know that. Getting the order right. Have you ever noticed how many great songs we sing in, in the church about surrender? Have you ever noticed at your campus today, the songs you sang gravitated around that theme, surrender? Well, what does that look like? It looks like at least three pillars, three stabilizing realities for our lives. The first starts back in verse 57 through 59 and gravitates around the notion, this biblical truth of relationship. That's the first thing relationship. So they, they, they lean into surrender, and the first leg of that, point A under three, is relationship. This whole thing about circumcision and naming the child on the eighth day, did you notice that? On the eighth day, they bring the baby, very Jewish custom, happened to Jesus. This whole thing about circumcision and naming on the eighth day in the community of other believers, that's all about relationship. The relationship that Zachariah and Elizabeth had with God and their uh, faith in him, when their world turned upside down, their response was not to abandon what they know about God and his faithfulness, their relationship to him. Instead, it was to lean into relationship where it takes place for Christians, relationship to God. Now, I see this a lot as a as a pastor. Someone gets their life turned upside down, good or bad, and it seems as though many times what happens is they forget about God. They come into money and they forget God has blessed you so that you would be a blessing. They experience a hardship, a death. They get a promotion. They get a bad diagnosis. And too often this is what I see. When life implodes, when life turns upside down, they forget about God. The relationship is strained. They shrug off God, or they give him the finger, or they turn their back on him, or they call him a villain. They abandon the very things that got them to faith in the first place. Church, Christian community, friends, prayer, scripture, relationships. But what do these two do? They leaned into what they know what they know of their faith. They lean into their faith and trust and hope in God and, 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 it, and it actually causes them to see where faithfulness gets grounded in the community of believers. That's who gathered around. That's who was there on that eighth day of naming and circumcision when everybody kind of protested. No, his name should be Zachariah. No, his name is John. They're in the community of friendship and prayer. Don't abandon the things that create relationship between us and one another, God that built faithfulness in the saving work of Jesus. They surrendered and decided to trust the relationship and to do that where relationship actually is always strengthened, the community of faith with other believers. But then add to that the second leg, the second pillar to surrender, which is clarity. In verses 60 through 66, Luke takes time to describe the fact that they followed through 
with the information they had, there was a lot of disclarity in their life. That's what happens when life turns upside down. The, it, life gets cloudy. The dust, the fog, the, everything kind of comes in on you, and you can't see past it. But there is some clarity in the middle of all the disclarity, in the middle of all the confusion. They did what we need to do. They did what God has made clear. What did God make, make clear? Well, certainly he said, name him John. They did that. They followed through with that. His name is John. That's what God said. Because look, many times when our lives get upended, we tend to forget what we clearly know. Sometimes we even react as if we don't know anything. A life interruption happens and it's like we get spiritual amnesia. And yet, for most of us who have been following Jesus for any length of time, we know certain things about God and his faithfulness very clearly. Maybe because of his history with us, His faithfulness, his promises shown to us, his grace extended to us, his forgiveness that we actually can feel, his love that we know. These things are very clear about God. In order to find stability, the stability of surrender when life turns inside out means we lean into relationship and we understand the clarity of what God has given to us, has shown us, what we know. Six years ago, last Friday, October 4th, our first grandchild was born. He was a grandson. His name is Jack Oliver Dreyer. He was born prematurely. Six years ago. He would have been six on Friday. He lived a strong and fighting 30 days. We cheered him on, and we thought he was going to go home. And then the unthinkable happened. He died at Denver General Hospital in the arms of my daughter. When that happened, you can imagine, because some of you have been there, our lives, our worlds imploded. It felt like they not only got turned inside out and upside down, it, it actually felt like we got crushed. Why was a constant companion for months. But I will tell you, the only thing that got us through and still gets us through to this day is leaning into, surrendering to, what we know about God, what is clear about God, about each other, about eternal life, about God's august love. The things that are clear and have been clear because God has made them known with clarity. The things he has said, the things he has shown, the things he has done. We tried to surrender to clarity. In the middle of all this darkness, we try to not let confusion and sadness and sorrow and anger and weakness make its home deep into our hearts because we know what would happen. You know what would happen. The bitterness, the anger, the confusion, that all makes its home in your heart and it's hard to break out. Surrender has three pillars that give us stability when life turns inside out relationship with God, with each other, with his word, with prayer, clarity for what he's already said to us. Elizabeth and Zechariah are leaning into it. And the third thing is certainty, certainty. The whole point of Luke's gospel, what he says at the very beginning is the point of why he's writing this. Like clarity, certainty gets us moving in the right direction. Because if you're not certain about what you're clear about, you're not probably going to move too far. But if you're certain about what you're clear about, you know the direction, you know where you're going, the directions are right before you, you're certain the directions are clear, and so you move in that direction. Certainty about God has made, what God has made clear is faith in action. And everybody lives by faith, right? We live by faith, not by sight. This is what Luke is saying. This is what Luke is writing this gospel for, particularly clarity and certainty about Jesus. Certainty about what God has made clear is faith and action. We live by faith. We are people of faith. But when you think about it, actually all human beings live by faith. We all live by faith at one level or another. Faith in something, faith in someone. Christian is the name God gives to anyone who by faith receives the truth of Jesus 
and the forgiveness of, his sin, of their sin by his atoning work on the cross, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead. Christian is the name you get when you put your, the weight of your trust on Jesus Christ. You become a Christ one. That becomes your name. You are a Christian, a Christ one. When you put your faith in him, a follower of Jesus. And as such, the certainty of that identity in Jesus, like Zechariah proclaimed in verse 79, what I think is the most beautiful verse in this whole text, he, Jesus, gives light to those who sit in darkness. Some of you are sitting there right now. And in the shadow of death, that's a horrible, hellish place to live. But then he adds, and he, Jesus, guides our feet out of that into the way of peace. One of the great certainties we have in this life because of our new name, names are important, because of Jesus, is that we can have peace with God. That's what this text is saying. In a world often dark, sometimes upside down, and often without a lot of stabilizing peace, we have a choice to make. If you're going through it, you have a choice to make. You can kick and rebel and scream and fight and live in the anxiety of why, hanging on you like chains, weighted chains. Or you can surrender that great biblical theme. You can surrender, surrender to the stability of relationship, clarity, certainty, and surrender, I will tell you, always leads to peace. Surrender in God's direction always leads to peace, peace with God, a restored peace in our lives, peace with our creator through Jesus, the one who knows you and loves you and cherishes you and longs for you to know him and to know his peace with certainty and clarity. I wonder if you long for that peace in your life today, that stability for relationship, for clarity, for certainty. By my reading of the text, it's all there in in Jesus. By my own personal testimony in my life of upside-down uncertainty, occasional inside-out living, I long for that. I find it in Jesus. Jesus. Like the old song says, Jesus, the name that charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease. It's music in the sinner's ears and life and health and peace. So let me ask you a question as I close. Is this a good moment in your life right now? Right this moment today, October 6th? Is this a good moment in your life right now to say to God, I want that peace? I want it back. I want to experience it. I want to know it. I want peace with God. Maybe you've been at war with him because you're angry, because you're mad, because he did something to you you thought was unfair or unjust. He allowed something to happen that you don't think he should have. I want that peace, God. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of hiding. I'm tired of, I need you. I give up. I've exhausted All my other options, perhaps? I'm at least exhausted by the anxiety of always trying to be in control of my life. I'm done hiding. I'm lost in my own delusion, and I'm ready to come home. I'm scared. I don't know what's happening in my life right now. This can't turn out well. It's a mess. But I want to trust you, God. Surrender. Surrender to the stabilizing faithfulness of God. Maybe before you walk out of these rooms today, that should be your prayer. Right where you are, God, I surrender. It's a theme throughout Scripture. How many years will it take us to learn that lesson? You know, one of of the most beautiful things about prayer is that the very best prayer is almost always a prayer of helplessness, of helplessness. It's almost always a prayer of helplessness. I know for a fact that some of you wrongly believe in order for God to get to hear your prayer, you need to do certain things. You need to stand the right way. You need to have the right posture. You need to have the right formula, the right words. You need to be, they need to be in the right order. Or you think, well, God's not going to listen to me. I'm 
I'm such a screwed up mess. God doesn't want to hear from me. I want you to know that today none of that is true. It is so profound and so clear with such certainty that God wants a relationship with us that he's always listening. He's always longing for you to call out to him. And often the very best way to do that is simply to say, help me. Help. Think about this. You wouldn't even be praying or think about prayer unless God had already been working on you. That tug you feel, that's God. That's the Holy Spirit here right now. Don't give yourself so much credit. It's God. God right here, right now, he's listening for you and for me to surrender. And I'm wondering if you will. So I'm going to close with a prayer that will include a pregnant moment of quiet. Zechariah lived nine months of quiet while his life was pregnant. This is going to be a pregnant moment for you to still your heart and say to God, help me. I surrender. Or maybe you need to say it for somebody you know. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I, I love you so much for what you've done for us, for how you've taken us and, and drawn us to yourself and given us every possible avenue of connection to you. I am praying for everyone who hears this text in your voice today that we would quietly, in the moments of our heart, whether they're broken, turbulent, or still, that we would say to you that simple prayer of helplessness, I surrender. We believe, God, we believe. Help us in our unbelief and increase our faith. For our good and your glory, I pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.